Political Capital is brought to you by Uber Canada. Learn more at uber.com slash flexibility works. Check podcasts. Hey everyone, and welcome to Political Capital, your source for all the latest in BC politics. I'm your host, Rob Shaw, back after a couple of weeks of summer break. Lots to catch up on, lots new as well to get our heads around it all. We are going to bring in the pod squad, not wasting any time here. Jillian Oliver, Allie Blades, and Jeff Ferrier, thank you for being here as always and getting us back up to speed. We will start with a big week for BC United and leader Kevin Falcon launching what was, I think, the largest proposed tax cut in BC history, certainly recent history, the elimination of the provincial um, income tax for almost two and a half million British Columbians, uh, promising to raise that income tax threshold from 12,000 to 50,000. Got a lot of attention, uh, a good policy move or a desperate move, or maybe both. Uh, what, uh, what stood out for you, Ali, when you saw and heard this and saw the reaction. You know, kudos to BC United where it's due. And then in the middle of the summer, they were able to get some attention from the media and from uh, voters in response to this. It, it, it's interesting, though, because it hasn't really done anything to move the dial in support. And, and there are scientific facts to prove that in that there was an abacus data poll that just came out today. Uh, that indicates that it didn't really move the dial for BC United in favor, given that this one was a really big potential where they could have picked up some votes. What I what I want to kind of explain in this for this particular policy, the BC United haven't chosen a lane. They want to be everything to everyone, and for those reasons, it's really backfiring. So if you're a conservative, you're looking at this policy announcement as potentially reckless spending. Um, it's not really fiscally prudent uh, characteristic of conservative voters that I think holds really high in their standards. Um, but then if you're a federal liberal, and we've talked about it before, how the BC United are bleeding federal liberals, it's also uh, in a position where the wealthiest British Columbians are also getting the same benefit as someone with a $65,000 annual salary and, you know, what would Krista Freeland say about that? I mean, she's always about taxing the 1%, so it doesn't really add up there Cancel either. Cancel your Disney those... Plus subscription is what she'd say. <laughs> but, yeah. And for those reasons, you know, it, it didn't really cater to the, the federal conservative side or the federal liberal side um, in which they are typically try to pick a lane in that, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Jillian, do you think it broke through, and, and Ali has referenced... Of one of the polls, although I don't think polls are scientific, but that's just me. But do you think it broke through any voter fog? Can this kind of thing be big enough that it gets the public attention? Or do they also get the attention of the questions Ali was asking there about the kind of backlash and questions about spending as well that come with it? I think at best it it, it shows voters that Falcon is willing to spend swing a little bigger than he has previously. Um, but that comes with a lot of risks, like the ones that Ali out, uh, outlined. And I would add another group to that, which is older voters who remember the impacts of the 2001 tax cuts, um, which didn't grow the economy and led to a lot of cuts in government services that I think people really understand are at the, the core of a lot of the problems that we're seeing now, cuts in things like education, mental health, um, and social services um, that we're seeing the downstream effects of now in you know various crises that we have um, that are top of mind for voters. So I think, you know, it's a, they're in a position where they do need to be doing something big and taking big swings to get attention and try to get traction. But I think in this case, um, it was such a big swing with so many um, kind of policy holes in it that a lot of that are easy to understand for voters. Um, I, I, I don't I think it makes sense that we're seeing polls that show that there hasn't been any um, increase in support for it. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what do you think? Um, I think it was a good day for Kevin Falcon and uh, the BC United. They've been uh, written off as also rans and they grab some uh, uh, attention and some headlines. And that's important if you're in third, fourth place 
You've got uh, teams of volunteers to keep motivated, candidates you want to keep on side, uh, getting some attention with a, a, a reasonably well-executed announcement like this is uh, is helpful. It's a bad day for the BC Conservatives. Agree with uh, Ali. Uh, it was a bewildering response from the BC Conservatives uh, without a, you know, not a clear message at all. I think it underlines that beyond the angry memes and the slogans, uh, it's there's a weak policy base uh, uh, to this group, and it should raise questions about whether folks are ready to govern. We're talking about polls and uh, uh, Kem Falcon's walking polls. We talk about them a lot on this show. I was uh, thinking this morning, like, what are walking polls? Like, what is that? You know, you get people strolling by and Kem Falcon comes up to you and it's like, hey, do you like me? And they're like, uh, OK, Kevin, I like you. Uh, you know, you're out there minding your own business and suddenly Kevin Falcon pops up, says, am I doing a great job? What are you going to say? No, Kevin, I think you're terrible. And here's why. No, you're trying to get you a coffee. You're on your way to work, you're on your way to the bust. Uh, me, I'd like to focus more on the sitting polls. Those are the polls that I really trust. And I think the abacus poll was one of those. That's where the real truth comes out. You're sitting, you've got time, you're relaxed, you're settled in. You're not rushing to catch a bus. You're not trying to escape a conversation with someone in fourth place in the polls. You're just sitting. That's when people get honest. So mm -hmm. fewer walking polls, more sitting polls. This won't probably move the dial, but will be helpful for the BC United trying to keep their candidates and volunteers motivated as they head into a tough time. I'm pretty much done with polls. I have to be honest at this point. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I kind of, um, I'm just not, uh, that pseudoscience, I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling like um, they may not be completely reflecting uh, what voters are actually going to do here 60 plus days uh, from now. I think, Jeff, partly because conservatives don't have a lot of policies out there and, and they're just sort of reacting to the name and to the idea of momentum and, and that type of thing. So I, I don't know, it's a, but it is, it is an interesting move by BC United. It did get a lot of pushback from the BC NDP. Uh, on the $5.4 billion revenue hole here with a bunch of lists of things that Premier David Eby listed off that he thinks United would cancel, like hospitals and schools and all cuts, sorts of cuts, things cuts. like that. Get ready cuts, for cuts, 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 cuts. cuts. That's Kevin Falcon is going to kick down the, the door of your grandmother's house and take her walker away from her to and cut back to pay for his tax, that kind of thing. A little bit That's apocalyptic. That's exactly what will happen. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's a little bit apocalyptic from a party running the largest <laughs> deficit in BC's history, but that's... That's Investing in people. We all agreed it was a good idea. Speaking of Premier David Eby, back from holidays this week uh, with a bit of a mess on his hands on the issue of the uh, true tree fruit sector in BC, the cooperative that went uh, under, leaving hundreds of farmers unable to get uh, their crop, mainly apples at this time of the year, uh, into cold storage or into packing and onto store shelves. So the premier returning, announcing a 15 to $20 million aid package for the BC fruit growers uh, and cherries and pears and apples and uh, stone fruits like that. Cleaning up a mess from his agriculture minister, Pam Alexis, who I don't think we can, we can talk about this. Um, Jillian, let's start with you on it. I don't know. I think she did a great job it kind of left EB uh, having to come right into the rescue here but uh, I don't the question is did he uh, do enough to execute that rescue um, I think it, it does seem like too little too late um, certainly industry doesn't seem to think it's going to be sufficient and I think it it sort of begs the question of you know if these problems were looming and mounting for so long, why is the government only reacting now that we're in a state of crisis? And I think that's a problem for them because it starts to look like a pattern um, where government is sort of stuck in this reactive mode. They are responsive. And I would say the BCNDP has been much more responsive when there are um, crises and, and issues. Um, but they don't seem to be able to get um, into a proactive stance on issues like this. Um, and I think, you know, that goes probably to the minister. Um, this is her file, not paying attention and, and kind of raising the issue earlier on, but also uh, made worse by the fact that she wasn't available to the press in sort of, you know, the week when this started to blow up, um, which sort of, you know, left them in scrambling. Um, and then, yeah, the response low in terms of funding, not enough to sort of cover the gap and, um, probably not even enough to sort of quiet this as an ele uh, election issue in the regions where it really matters. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. Uh, David Eby's office, 
uh, very good at identifying a, a quick solution to a problem and turning it around in a very short period of time, this aid package in under a couple of weeks. But the government knew it was coming. Um, they knew the, the cooperatives collapsing. They had members there. Uh, and sometimes you get the sense that the premier has to pick up the messes of files that other people should have been more on top of before they became the messes uh, he has to fix, Ali. I, I don't know if uh, that jumps out at you. No, I completely agree with, with what Jillian was saying. It, it is a little too late. This is coming from uh, the farmers that are dealing with all of this now. Um, they're saying that they're, they're not hopeful, uh, that even with uh, a lot of money coming towards them and now some consultation uh, has been um, too late. And, and this isn't because this is like a, a very... the. Uh, uh, specific timeline in that they have to get these apples to market now. Uh, so uh, there has been a ton of criticism there. And I think that on the on the Pam Alexis uh, part, it is not a name that we will stop talking about just because I, I think this is really going to continue to grow on the fact that like, do these ministers realize that there's an election happening? Like, did we not get that memo? I, I do want to talk about something that I think is very interesting in that um, the Okanagan, specifically the, the Kelowna, where this is happening, is a political battleground. Um, this is an area where it has traditionally been BC United, uh, held by the three Kelowna ridings, BC United right now. There's a new riding, Kelowna Centre, where there's a potential, given the demographics and this wonderful candidate that they have in Loyal uh, Woodridge, that they could potentially win it. All of this to say that given that it's a battleground, given that there's a possibility that the NDP might be actually able to break through, this should have been uh, sorted out much earlier just on winning strategy alone. Um, so I thought I thought that was um, a missed opportunity for the NDP. Mm -hmm. Probably very frustrating to the small number of rural MLAs they have, like Rolly Russell, the parliamentary secretary for rural uh, issues, who's been stick handling the winery. Uh, issue quite well and is watching uh, his government fall flat on its face um, until it kind of <laughs> has to, Premier's got to return and fix all the mess. Jeff, what uh, jumped out at you on this? So in the previous segment, you trolled me for the NDP running a giant out of control uh, deficit. I did. And I trolled you good. We'll go back. Yeah, it was good. This, it, yeah. it landed. Uh, plus one for <laughs> plus one for Rob on that one. But that's here, here we are in a situation where you're in an election period, and this is providing context. This is a tough situation, by the way, for the, as we all know, for the farmers who've already endured one of the harshest winters in, in memory. They had flash frost wiping out much of this year's crop, and and the cooperative going away added to that is uh, is a, a body blow, and uh, it, it absolutely requires government uh, intervention and help, and uh, both from BC and I would hope at a certain point from uh, Ottawa. Uh, but you, here we are in this situation where you're in an election campaign period and you have the other opposition parties, not the Greens, but the Conservatives in the United saying you, you're spending too much money, you're running out of control deficits, you're putting our credit rating uh, at risk, stop spending so much money. And here they are criticizing the government for not spending enough uh, money to support uh, farmers. Uh, it's kind of the the the, the big challenge that governments uh, always face on these issues. I think though that on this issue of agriculture, it's a much bigger problem than just this one year, not to minimize the problem this year, it's real. And we gotta get money to those uh, farmers quickly, but we're seeing more extreme weather, floods, frost, fires, uh, uh, drought, it's not going away. And it raises a really fundamental question. Do we wanna have a reliable food supply in a world where uh, risk to crops are increasing and we're gonna see more crop failures and more problems for our, our farm community. And if we do, we have to invest significantly in helping our farmers not just adapt, but when the years are bad, we got to plan for emergency aid uh, to backstop these folks uh, when crops fail. Uh, otherwise, you get one bad year and the farmers out of, out of business and they can't do this all on their own. Uh, low interest loans or no interest loans are uh, an okay stop. Uh, gap measure. But it, over the long run, we need the province, in my view, to invest in agriculture, uh, in long term income support programs for farmers so that when the crops fail, the money's there for them. And uh, uh, 
it's unclear if the right wing parties and particularly the conservatives with their climate denial and resistance to action on that front uh, are up to the task. Mm -hmm. You do hear a consistent theme from last year's drought uh, and feed shortage into the winery collapse this year and then into the fruit tree collapse that the industry needs cash, you know, government backed cash loans, interest free loans uh, because they're dying, like they, they're financially unable to continue their farms uh, as they wait for, you know, they're all creditors in the, the collapse of this co-op now because they haven't been paid for last year's crops and they've got to, this year's crops are wiped out and then they got to invest in future crops that don't um, produce, uh, you know, fruit for another few years. So it really is a, a crunch that they're in and, and I don't think any party has really sketched out how to how to address that quite yet. I just want to make it, try, I make it a little bit simpler because that was a bit rambly. Um, uh, I think it's there needs to be a big cup pot of government money uh, ready for farmers for when their crops fail, as they will in the years ahead, so that when things go bad, they don't go bankrupt and they can try again next year. Otherwise, we're not going to have a, a, a food supply. We're going to be uh, relying on uh, foreign imports. And in an uncertain world, that's not a great way to ensure that you've got the food you need to feed your people. Jillian, as our chief rural correspondent from Nelson, um, these, this, this kind of issue, the rural-urban divide we sometimes talk about, New Democrats slower to respond to things outside of Metro Vancouver. Does that pick up any kind of election steam on, on this type of issue for from critics who want to point to that? Well, yeah, I certainly think that one of the reasons why government is stuck in such a responsive mode is because they've got so many balls in the air trying to cater to so many different um, demographics. Obviously, the premier isn't from an urban riding. His big focus has been housing, which is you know primarily an urban issue. Um, and it's just it's hard, especially when you're running a lot of um, policy out of the premier's office uh, rather than delegating to ministers to to have the attention to detail that you need to sort of be proactive in the face of crises. Um, I do think, you know, they have some good programs in addition to, I think, you know, the need to implement those no interest loans like Jeff was talking about. They have those in other provinces and they work well. Um, there's some programs that invest in climate resiliency. So helping farmers adapt by buying equipment, um, conducting research on how their individual uh, climates are changing in their regions and, and how they can adapt and, and be more responsive to that, but it's just underfunded simply. So I think, yeah, they're stretched in a lot of a lot of different um, directions. And certainly I think we'll see um, local opposition uh, candidates campaigning on that. We've got farmers running for all three parties. Um, Greens are running a few. I'm, I'm sure there's a few in, in Conservatives and United as well. So certainly I think it's an opportunity in, in some of those local writings. Let's jump to the next topic, Ali. I'm going to uh, bring you in first on this one. A proposed class action lawsuit filed in court this week by the families of two teenage girls who allege, and their families allege, uh, became addicted to drugs in part because of the availability of government-supplied uh, safe supply pills. The lawsuit says the government was negligent in calling this safer supply, not monitoring the diversion of this prescription medical-grade hydromorphone onto the streets where it's sold as dillies. Uh, as they're called, and not shutting the program down when it became clear all of this was happening. Not certified in court yet, uh, and nothing proven in court, um, but one of the teenage girls whose parents are, are advocating for this died of an overdose a couple of years ago at the age of 14. So certainly has reignited the safe supply debate again here in BC, and uh, the extent to which government has handled the diversion issue that we've talked about quite a bit in the past. Ali, so where do you think this goes? Um, does it you know, feed into... Uh, any election narratives? Is it uh, a kind of a one-off thing or how do you think it plays here? I, I think it's important to know that this is a very like sad, sad situation. I think we can all agree on that and that um, when we talk about this, we all, everyone has to be very careful to not uh, be drawn into the political talking points and the political theater of it all. Um, but in the lead up to the election, it is important to talk about it in the political context because one, it ensures that it continues to be an issue uh, that the government should be held accountable to. Uh, and the other is that we really do need to resolve these issues quite quickly. And so for those reasons, um, I think it, it is uh, a good thing uh, that this case might go through. Like you said, it hasn't been certified quite yet. And so what this means 
is that we will continue to talk about safe supply in that in this in this context by calling it safe supply and using that word safe, do we need to change that? So that's something that the government needs to sort out. Um, involuntary uh, treatments, that's something that David Eby continues to talk about uh, in his interviews quite uh, consistently. So, you know, that's that's because of that accountability from oppositional parties and these these families that continue to be brave enough to come forward with, these, with their stories. Um, and so what, in that same vein, what I'm hopeful is that given that Eleanor Sturko from the Conservatives has been such a uh, powerful voice in the lead of the opposition, from the opposition, um, this oppositional voice, that the Conservatives will then, will potentially see a really good policy come from them or a sophisticated policy from them, just because it is one of those issues that one of their representatives continue to, um, to talk about uh, quite consistently. The, in talking to Sturco this week, the conservative position seems to be, and they haven't quite ruled it out officially, but to, to roll back safer supply to a kind of witnessed supply, sort of like methadone, where you have to, if you're going to get the pills, you need to use them um, and not uh, divert them out onto the street where they're resold. United, not quite there, but uh, talking about more checks and balances, and the NDP talking about tracking um, the safe supply pills to know the extent of the problem, Jeff, if you put all that Together, that's where the parties are on the issue. Um, what do you think the discussion is going to look like? Uh, I hope it is a discussion that is focused on the folks like the families who've lost loved ones to uh, addiction. And uh, uh, I fear it is going to become a hyper uh, politicized and it has become a hyper uh, politicized a debate. I don't think that Eleanor Sturko has been a shining light of, of vision on these issues. I, I, I've found her to be uh, uh, exploitive uh, uh, in trying to advance political ends, uh, trading off the suffering of people who are going through awful uh, things in their life, blaming uh, things the government is doing when we all know that addiction is a complex and almost never about someone stumbling across drugs and getting tricked into a life of addiction that involves mental health and trauma. And Thank you uh, to the panel for being here. Thank you for, for watching and make sure you subscribe to the podcast for audio extras. We're available on YouTube and other streaming services as well. We will be back next week with all the latest here on Political Capital. Political Capital is brought to you by Uber Canada. Learn more at uber.com slash flexibilityworks.